I'm basically here to talk about a couple of the most classic mistakes that I see, whether it's those I see when I advise other founders, um, and I would say I've probably made all of these myself in one form or other. Um, so before I dive into the seven mistakes and take you through them, I want to give you the kind of quick background. Um, I am the founder of a company called The Muse that helps about a million people a month figure out what they want to do with their lives. Uh, and we work with about 120 companies, some in New York, some in Silicon Valley, uh, some elsewhere in the US, to help them hire and, and communicate their culture more effectively. So I also get the benefit of, of learning from their mistakes. So what are some of the class up entrepreneur and startup founder mistakes? Um, I'm going to run through the gamut relatively quickly in the next 20 minutes. Um, the first is idea versus product market fit. So how do you understand and test and refine an idea before you launch? How do you then find the right business partners and the right founders? Um, how do you make sure you're focusing on the right things and uh, you're getting you know, your work out there versus waiting for it to be perfect? We'll talk a little bit about how to create an audience and velocity around what it is that you're building so you know whether it's working or not because you have an audience of people who are not your family or your college roommate. Um, how to find a team to work with you on the idea, and then finally, when to and when not to believe the hype. So the first thing I want to talk quickly about is product market fit. This is a phrase that gets thrown out quite a lot when people are starting businesses, but ultimately it means how do you know that you have the right idea and the right uh, specific iteration of that idea for your market? Uh, this is really kind of the essence of testing and refining an idea, and I like to call it your college roommate's approval does not mean market demand. I talk to first-time entrepreneurs all the time, and I myself was very guilty of this in my early days, who say, I had this idea, I told my five best friends and my mom, and they all think it's brilliant. And that's great. They might be right, but those people love you. And ultimately, to get a sense of whether your idea is really going to be a fit in the broader market, you've got to get in front of people who don't know you, who don't like you, and ideally people who have no reason at all to be nice to you. Once you do that, you can start to collect data like it's your job. Because as the founder of a business, especially one that lives online, it is. When we launched the Muse, we used Crazy Egg, a tool called Crazy Egg, to track mouse movements. We used Mixpanel to see what people were clicking on. And we were able to learn about the ways that people were using our product that were nothing like how we had potentially envisioned it. But more on this later, but I want to quickly say, when you're starting a business or a product and pushing it out into the world, there's also often a tendency to look for founders with certain skill sets that you need and to feel alone enough that any founder will do. This is a massive classic mistake, and I think honestly if there's one thing you can take away uh, from my experience and the things that I wish I had learned, it would be to think very, very carefully about people that you partner with, especially in the early stages of your business. Uh, this is myself with my two co-founders of The Muse. Um, I honestly can say that I would take a bullet for each of them, but that hasn't always been the case. And in fact, in a previous business, uh, I started a company with little more than an agreement written on two pieces of notebook paper, and it ended very, very badly. So as hard as it is in the beginning when all you want to do is get started and get, a, you know, get building, um, I think it's very, very important to sit down and think about you know, what happens if we're about to run out of money and we have to tap networks or we have to take out loans? Um, how comfortable is everyone in the partnership with things that might happen in the absolute worst case end of the spectrum and in the absolute best case? So if the New York Times calls and says, we want to feature your company and we want to talk to one of you, who is that going to be? And getting alignment on those things early on will save you a lot of trouble and heartache down the road. Uh, and I'm happy to speak from experience about that later on. Third is perfect versus done. Um, I like to call this the just fucking launch already slide. Uh, I think that you know there's a lot of people, especially again when you've got an idea, you started thinking about it, and you begin to turn it into reality. And you can turn it a little bit like Gollum in Lord of the Rings, where you sit there polishing it in the corner, saying, you know, my precious, my precious, and it's gorgeous and it's beautiful. But again, no one has seen it. There's a lot that you need to. There's a lot that you need to push your product out into the public for before you can really understand how some of it works. Um, we saw this very much firsthand when we got into Y Combinator, which is uh, an incubator program run by Paul Graham out in Silicon Valley. Um, we had started with our job search site. It was very much in its infancy. We were starved for cash. And so when we got this infusion of advice, respect, and funding that came with Y Combinator, we thought to ourselves, this is our chance to go big. We're going to create the best job product in the entire universe. So this was the first thing that we came up with. Um, if you look at it, it has seven different massively complicated features. We were going to do data visualizations. We were going to integrate with every possible social network. We were going to tell you, based on X, Y, and Z, what would be the right job for you. It was a really interesting idea, but again, 
Something like this would take six months to build, and so we went into our first meeting with Paul Graham, and we told him excitedly, this is what we're thinking of doing. He cut us off already and said, by the time you build this, your company is going to be dead. You need to just fucking launch already. Um, and he was right. We really needed to simplify. We wanted to distill down all the brilliant things we thought we might want to do at some point into the one core thing that our existing team could execute on, ideally within seven to 10 days. And that's actually what we did. One all-nighter and about 12 business days later, we launched the very first product on TechCrunch. Now, I'm not particularly proud of this product. It's not the most beautiful thing we've ever done, but it accomplished the point, which was putting something out there um, in the world that explained the essence of what we were trying to do with the Muse so we could see how people reacted. Um, I also like to call this one, an ugly baby is, no, is, is better than no baby at all, which means, again, if you wait and wait and wait for your product to be perfect before you release that into the world, you will often never get there. So I am a big supporter of the minimum viable product and taking something that is, again, the, the simplest explanation of your idea and putting it in the marketplace so you can start to get feedback. So next, number four, productive or impactful? Um, this was something that was particularly challenging for me as an entrepreneur because um, you know, I like to feel very productive. I like to get a lot done. And it was very easy for me to wake up every morning and look at my inbox and just start going down the list and going down the list. And I could easily spend hours answering email, maybe taking meetings with people, and feel like I had a very productive day. But if I wasn't accomplishing the things that moved us towards our most important metrics, then I hadn't really accomplished anything at all. An example is we used to have, um, we, when we first launched the very first version of the Muse, we had videos that people could watch to see inside these different companies. And not as many people were watching videos as we had anticipated they would. So we spent a lot of time thinking to ourselves, well, how can we increase the number of people watching videos? And as a team, we spent hours and hours, you know, A-B testing different ideas. Well, maybe if we put a big playhead on the video, or maybe if we put a, a call to action over here. But ultimately, having people watch more videos is not the core point of the Muse. If you really ask us what are the key metrics that our business is going to live or die on, it's are people applying to jobs? Are they sharing the site with their friends? And if watching more videos means that they have a better experience and therefore are more likely to apply to a job or to share it with their friends, that's great. But just getting people to watch videos in and of itself is not a key metric for us. And we really eventually, after spending a good amount of team time on this, had to take a step back and say, all right, is this the most important problem we could be solving? I kind of think of it as if um, you know, that, that classic time management um, story that you've all probably heard where you know, if you have a jar and you fill it with big rocks, then you can put little rocks in, and then you can put sand in, and then you can put water in. Every single day, I think it's really important to figure out what are the tasks or the metrics that are most important for my business success today and make sure that you clear enough time for those because everything else you could spend an indefinite amount of time doing. All right, uh, this one is a personal favorite of mine. It's this idea of how do you create velocity? I think people often feel like if, if I build it, they will come. A great line from a movie, not so helpful in practice with startups. In fact, for the most point, if you build it, they won't come because unless you can figure out a way to get people to learn about your product in the first place and then share it with others, it's really hard to sort of start the engine of customer acquisition. Um, there's a couple of classic strategies that people usually use. Uh, word of mouth is fantastic, you can get it, but again, people have to have heard of you in order to be able to share. Uh, social media is another good one, uh, making something that people are excited to share on Facebook, on Twitter, Pinterest, or LinkedIn. Um, I know some great startups that have done contests to really jumpstart uh, social media, uh, spreading the word. Blogging, I think, is a really important one. Um, we did this very successfully at The Muse. When we first started, we didn't have enough jobs on the site or enough of a job search engine to make anyone particularly interested in our product, but we did have was some great career advice. And so we started getting people to write about how do you ace an interview? How do you deal with uh, you know, a really difficult question? Or how do you write a very successful thank you note? And not only did we publish these pieces of content on our own site, where a lot of people came to see them, but we actually called up Forbes, Mashable, Yahoo, and gave them that content for free as well, with links to our pieces back, uh, links back to the Muse throughout the middle. Um, we had maybe 5,000 people in the very first month that we were alive find us this way, and that number has grown every single month since. Because again, by blogging on your own site or for someone else, it's an amazing way to get your link out there and get your name out there. Um, advertising, 
I generally don't recommend in the early days because spending a lot of money acquiring users can mask the fact that people may not actually want what you're building, which as I said is one of the most important things to find out early on. If you can convert a dollar spent on acquiring someone into more than one dollar of revenue, by all means go do it, but uh, I see a lot of people who instantly get their first little bit of revenue and say, you know, I'm gonna buy users to come look at my free product, and uh, that can be very, very dangerous. And then finally, writing op-eds in press. So this is pitching your story or your perspective to a wider audience. Um, and I find this really helpful in a couple of ways. Obviously, if you are launching, you wanna get it in front of a reporter uh, to write about you, or you can ask them for permission to write a guest post that you can publish yourself. For example, if a place like VentureBeat won't necessarily write about you, you may be able to write about your experience of creating a new product or something else about your own lessons and your own process and get that published and said for the audience. Um, and you know, I like to think about uh, thinking about what is the reporter getting out of it. So um, most of you, I'm sure some of you in here have worked in the press before. Um, they get hundreds and hundreds of email a day from people who say, I'm smart, I'm special, I'm launching this great new thing, please write about me. And it's really hard to even process that amount of uh, information, much less understand you know, which stories to write. Uh, personally, I found that tying what you're doing to macro trends is really helpful for getting people's attention. So saying that you know, the number of women earning undergraduate degrees is on the rise, and therefore my product that relates to this in some way is going to you know, either counteract or increase this trend, uh, very, very much ups your chances. And also thinking about it as a, as a story. Um, my very first company before The Muse, we tried to keep ourselves as founders completely out of it. And we thought you know, the, the focus should be on the product and on the company and no one wants to know about us. But unfortunately, unless your product or company is already successful, people do actually want to know about you. And in fact, they might care much more about your own story than they would about a company that doesn't necessarily have a persona. Um, so we found a lot of success by really thinking about and pitching uh, ourselves, our relationship, and our process of starting this company as the kind of hero of that story. Number six is team building. I think this is really important for a few ways. Uh, this is part of the team at The Muse. We're a little bit bigger than this now. Um, and you know, the way that we were able to reach out and find and attract every single one of these people um, and convince them, in most cases, to take far less money than they would have taken elsewhere uh, it was a really interesting learning process during which we made lots of mistakes. Um, firstly, in terms of where we find people, you have the classic job sites, um, LinkedIn, Indeed, as well as newer sites like AngelList is a great one. Obviously, The Muse, we do it as well. But in the early, early days, most of the people that you're going to be talking to who might be a great fit to join your company are going to come from either your networks, your employees' networks, um, or potentially what I like to call lurking. I've done this to great success and know a lot of people who have as well. It's essentially looking on uh, communities that you're part of online. In my case, um, Hacker News, Twitter, but for other people it may be different ones. And finding people whose work you really admire, uh, whose voice you find very interesting, or who work at a company that has recently suffered a major financial difficulty and reaching out to them to see if they'd be interested in working with you. Um, I have not hired anyone off of the ladder, but I know a couple of people who regularly in their early days looked on industry blogs to see what companies were dying or hit by major lawsuits and then aggressively reached out to really interesting people at those companies to say, if you're thinking of your next opportunity, I'd like to talk to you. And again, it's not these days about what you're offering from a financial perspective, which is great because usually if you're starting a business, money is one of the things you have in shortest supply. Um, in general, what we see across all the companies that hire with us is that people are much more driven by these factors. It's the work that you're going to be doing, who you're going to be doing it with and for, what is the atmosphere, and I think that's actually an incredible uh, asset for anyone who's trying to get something off the ground and recruit people to join them. Because again, you may not be able to compete even remotely on salary. I've seen people take 50, 60, in one case 70% salary cuts because the idea of joining this project or this company in the early stages was so interesting and they believed in what the founder had to offer. Um, so I think this is something that, you know, that is incredible. And obviously, as you grow, you can increase perks, you can increase uh, salary, but I think it's really important to never lose sight of the fact that generally people are working with you because there's a, a vision they believe in or an opportunity to learn they think they can get that they may not get elsewhere. And I think it's really important um, as you know, someone now who's responsible for a number of employees to constantly think about 
what can I do and what can we do as a company to help each of them get to where they would like to go with that. Um, and then, you know, within that point, um, you've got to interview wisely. Some people seem fantastic on paper. They may even make a great first impression. But I think it's really helpful to drill down into you know, questions around their motivation. So what is it that you're excited about working on this company? Uh, what are you excited to do on a day-to-day -day basis? And really be transparent yourself so that the expectations they have and the reality of the position they're going to be joining align. Because um, while sometimes I think a classic startup founder mistake is to recruit people so aggressively that they either don't vet them properly or they overpromise and underdeliver. And neither of those situations results in a team that's really going to be with you for the long haul. And then, last but not least, don't believe the hype. I think this is the reality of a lot of startups in their early days, and it is a train wreck, uh, one that has actually fallen out of a window and plummeted to the ground below. Um, it's very, very common for young companies to feel inside like everything is going wrong while projecting an external image that everything is going right. And I think it can be very, very difficult um, when you're getting something off the ground to spend too much time in the press of your industry. And it seems like everyone's getting covered by the most sexy press and sexy blogs. Everyone's getting funded by the best possible investors, and everyone else has it together. But ultimately, that's generally not true. And as you grow, you start to see some of the cracks behind other people's carefully put together facades. And that's actually why I think, going back to the beginning, that it's so important to really make sure people want what it is you're offering, you surround yourself with great founders and a good team, and that you're relentlessly testing that in the market to make sure you're heading in the right direction. Because otherwise, it can be really hard to stand up to what seems like uh, you know, everyone else doing better or doing differently than you. When we were first starting The Muse and getting it off the ground, I pitched 150 investors in a row, of which 148 said no, and two said yes. And uh, it was not fun. And people asked, well, how did you not give up after the you know, 95th person said, I don't think this is a good idea. I'm not going to back you. And the answer is because we were, we were tracking things. We were watching the numbers. We were talking to users who were people we didn't know. And that gave us the confidence to push forward and to believe in the product. And when you know, 300 users turns into 3,000, turns into 30,000, turns into 3 million, suddenly you've got something that's too big to ignore. But you've got to get there first by not believing the hype. So that's it. Those are my kind of seven classic mistakes. Um, I'm going to stick around afterwards for a bit and uh, happy to talk more. But thank you guys so much. Mm -hmm.